hey, before we get started, I just wanted to address something that I brought up in the State of the Show episode, the Buddhist episode 11. I mentioned that I would be going to Japan, and due to factors very distantly outside of my control, that has been postponed temporarily. So just know that as we go forward and as we continue to have conversations about Buddhism, for the time being at least, I will be still in the United States. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Bright on Buddhism. This week we will be reading and discussing a classic of the Pali Canon, the Samanapala Sutta. This sutta's title translates to The Fruits of the Contemplative Life, and in it, King Ajatasattu, the monarch of the Magadha kingdom from which the Buddha himself hails, feels the desire to hear a Dharma discourse and questions six renunciants. These renunciants each respectively pose their cases for amoralism, fatalism, materialism, eternalism, restraint or Jainism, and agnosticism. Then, the king questions the Buddha, who argues for the fruits of the Buddhist path. The king then admits to the killing of his own father to seize the throne of Magadha, and the Buddha accepts his confession and tells him that his effort to make amends will result in his future enlightenment. The king becomes a lay follower of Buddhism, and the sutta concludes. This text is the second discourse contained in the Diga Nikaya of the Pali Canon, and the translation we are using comes to us from Tanisuro Bhikkhu. We hope you enjoy. I have heard that on one occasion the Blessed One was staying at Rajagriha in Jivaka Kamarabacha's mango grove with a large sangha of monks, 1,250 monks in all. Now at that time, it being the Upasatha day, the full moon night of the water lily season, the fourth month of the rains, King Ajatasattu of Magadha, the son of Queen Vaidehi, was sitting on the roof terrace of his palace surrounded by his ministers. Then he felt inspired to exclaim, How wonderful is this moonlit night! How beautiful, how lovely, how inspiring, how auspicious is this moonlit night. What contemplative or Brahmin should we visit tonight who, on being visited, would make our mind clear and serene? When this was said, one of the ministers said to the king, Your Majesty, there is Paranakashapa, the leader of a community, the leader of a group, the teacher of a group, honored and famous, esteemed as holy by the mass of people. He is aged, long gone forth, advanced in years, in the last phase of his life. Your majesty should visit him. Perhaps, if visited by you, he would make your mind clear and serene. When this was said, the king remained silent. Then another minister said to the king, Your majesty, there is Makali Gosala. Your majesty, there is Ajita Kasakambalin. Your majesty, there is Pakuda Kachayana. Your majesty, there is Sanjaya Vela Taputta. Your majesty, there is Nigantha Nataputta, the leader of a community, the leader of a group the teacher of a group, honored and famous, esteemed as holy by the mass of people. He is aged, long gone forth, advanced in years, in the last phase of life. Your majesty should visit him. Perhaps, if visited by you, he would make your mind clear and serene. When this was said, the king remained silent. All this time, Jivaka Kamarabacha was sitting silently not far from the king. So the king said to him, Friend Jivaka, why are you silent? Your Majesty, there is a blessed one, worthy and rightly self-awakened, staying in my mango grove with a large sangha of monks, 1,250 monks in all. Concerning this blessed one, this admirable report has been spread. Indeed, the blessed one is worthy and rightly self-awakened, consummate in clear knowing and conduct, well gone, an expert with regard to the cosmos, unexcelled trainer of people, fit to be tamed, teacher of devas and human beings, awakened, blessed. Your Majesty should visit him, Perhaps if visited by you, he would make your mind clear and serene. Then in that case, friend Jivaka, have the riding elephants prepared. Responding, as you say, your majesty, having had 500 female elephants prepared as well as the king's personal tusker, Jivaka announced to the king, your majesty, your riding elephants are prepared. Do what you think it is now time to do. Then the king, having had 500 of his women mounted on the 500 female elephants, one on each, and having mounted his own personal tusker, set out from the capital in full royal state, with attendants carrying torches, headed for Jivaka Kamarabacha's mango grove. But when the king was not far from the mango grove, he was gripped with fear, trepidation, his hair standing on end. Fearful, agitated, his hair standing on end, he said to Jivaka Kamarabacha, Friend Jivaka, 
You aren't deceiving me, are you? You aren't betraying me, are you? You aren't turning me over to my enemies, are you? How can there be such a large sangha of monks, 1250 in all, with no sound of sneezing, no sound of coughing, no voices at all? Don't be afraid, great king. Don't be afraid. I'm not deceiving you or betraying you or turning you over to your enemies. Go forward, great king. Go forward. Those are lamps burning in the pavilion hall. Then the king, going as far on his tusker as the ground would permit, dismounted and approached the door of the pavilion hall on foot. On arrival, he asked Jivaka, Where, friend, Jivaka, is the Blessed One? That is the Blessed One, great king, sitting against the middle pillar, facing east, surrounded by the Sangha of monks. Then the king approached the Blessed One, and, on reaching him, stood to one side. As he was standing there, surveying the Sangha of monks, sitting in absolute silence, utterly clear and serene, like a lake, he felt inspired to exclaim, May my son, Prince Udayabada, enjoy the same stillness that this Sangha of monks now enjoys. The Blessed One said, Have you come, great king, together with your affections? Lord, my son, Prince Udayabada, is very dear to me. May he enjoy the same stillness that this Sangha of monks now enjoys. Then, bowing down to the Blessed One and saluting the Sangha of monks with his hands palm to palm over his heart, he sat to one side. As he was sitting there, he said to the Blessed One, I would like to ask the Blessed One about a certain issue if he would give me the opportunity to explain my question. Ask, great king, whatever you like. Lord, there are these common craftsmen, elephant trainers, horse trainers, charioteers, archers, standard bearers, camp marshals, supply corps officers, high royal officers, commandos, military heroes, armor-clad warriors, leather-clad warriors, domestic slaves, confectioners, barbers, bath attendants, cooks, garland makers, laundrymen, weavers, basket makers, potters, calculators, accountants, and any other craftsmen of a similar sort. They live off the fruits of their crafts, visible in the here and now. They give happiness and pleasure to themselves, to their parents, wives, and children, to their friends and colleagues. They put in place an excellent presentation of offerings to contemplatives and brahmins, leading to heaven, resulting in happiness, conducive to a heavenly rebirth. Is it possible, Lord, to point out a similar fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now? Do you remember, great king, ever having asked this question of other contemplatives and brahmins? Yes, I do. If it isn't troublesome for you, how did they answer? No, it is not troublesome for me, wherever the Blessed One, or someone like the Blessed One, is sitting. Then speak, great king. Once, Lord, I approached Purana Kashapa, and, on arrival, exchanged courteous greetings with him. After an exchange of friendly greetings and courtesies, I sat to one side. As I was sitting there, I asked him, Venerable Kashapa, there are these common craftsmen. They live off the fruits of their crafts, visible in the here and now. Is it possible, Venerable Sir, to point out a similar fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now? When this was said, Purana Kashapa said to me, Great King, in acting or getting others to act, in mutilating or getting others to mutilate, in torturing or getting others to torture, in inflicting sorrow or in getting others to inflict sorrow, in tormenting or getting others to torment, in intimidating or getting others to intimidate, in taking life, taking what is not given, breaking into houses, plundering wealth, committing burglary, ambushing highways, committing adultery, speaking falsehood, one does no evil. If, with a razor-edged disc, one were to turn all the living beings on this earth to a single heap of flesh, a single pile of flesh, there would be no evil from that cause, no coming of evil. Even if one were to go along the right bank of the Ganges, killing and getting others to kill, mutilating and getting others to mutilate, torturing and getting others to torture, there would be no evil from that cause, no coming of evil. Even if one were to go along the left bank of the Ganges, giving and getting others to give, making sacrifices and getting others to make sacrifices, there will be no merit from that cause, no coming of merit. Through generosity, self-control, restraint, and truthful speech, there is no merit from that cause, no coming of merit. Thus, when asked about a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, Purana Kashapa answered with non-action. Just as if a person, when asked about a mango, were to answer with a breadfruit, or when asked about a breadfruit, were to answer with a mango. In the same way, when asked about a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, Purana Kashapa answered with non-action. The thought occurred to me, how can anyone like me think of disparaging a contemplative or Brahmin living in his realm? Yet I neither delighted in Purana Kashapa's words, nor did I protest against them. 
Neither delighting nor protesting, I was dissatisfied. Without expressing dissatisfaction, without accepting his teaching, without adopting it, I got up from my seat and left. Another time I approached Makali Gosala, and on arrival exchanged courteous greetings with him. After an exchange of friendly greetings and courtesies, I sat to one side. As I was sitting there, I asked him, Venerable Gosala, there are these common craftsmen. They live off the fruits of their crafts, visible in the here and now. Is it possible, venerable sir, to point out a similar fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now? When this was said, Makali Gosala said to me, Great king, there is no cause, no requisite condition, for the defilement of beings. Beings are defiled without cause, without requisite condition. There is no cause, no requisite condition, for the purification of beings. Beings are purified without cause, without requisite condition. There is nothing self-caused, nothing other-caused, nothing human-caused. There is no strength, no effort, no human energy, no human endeavor. All living beings, all life, all beings, all souls, are powerless, devoid of strength, devoid of effort. Subject to the changes of fate, serendipity, and nature, they are sensitive to pleasure and pain in the six great classes of birth. There are one million four hundred thousand six thousand and six hundred principal modes of origin. There are five hundred kinds of karma, five kinds and three kinds, full karma and half karma. There are sixty-two pathways, sixty-two sub-eons, six wanderers, four thousand nine hundred naga abodes, two thousand faculties, three thousand hells, thirty-six dust realms, seven spheres of percipient beings, seven spheres of non-percipient beings, seven kinds of jointed plants, seven kinds of deities, seven kinds of human beings, seven kinds of demons, seven great lakes, seven major knots, seven minor knots, seven hundred major precipices, seven hundred minor precipices, seven hundred major dreams, seven hundred minor dreams, eighty-four thousand great eons. Having transmigrated and wandered on through these, the wise and the foolish alike will put an end to pain. Though one might think, through this morality, this practice, this austerity, or this holy life, I will ripen unripened karma and eliminate ripened karma whenever touched by it, that is impossible. Pleasure and pain are measured out. The wandering on is fixed in its limits. There is no shortening or lengthening, no accelerating or decelerating. Just as a ball of string, when thrown, comes to its end simply by unwinding, in the same way, having transmigrated and wandered on, the wise and the foolish alike will put an end to pain. Thus, when asked about a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, Makala Gosala answered with purification through wandering on. Just as if a person, when asked about a mango, were to answer with a breadfruit, or, when asked about a breadfruit, were to answer with a mango. In the same way, when asked about a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, Makali Gosala answered with purification through wandering on. The thought occurred to me, how can anyone like me think of disparaging a contemplative or Brahmin living in his realm? Yet I neither delighted in Makali Gosala's words nor did I protest against them. Neither delighting nor protesting I was dissatisfied. Without expressing dissatisfaction, without accepting his teaching, without adopting it, I got up from my seat and left. Another time, I approached Ajita Kesakambalan, and, on arrival, exchanged courteous greetings with him. After an exchange of friendly greetings and courtesies, I sat to one side. As I was sitting there, I asked him, Venerable Ajita, there are these common craftsmen. They live off the fruits of their crafts, visible in the here and now. Is it possible, Venerable Sir, to point out a similar fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now. When this was said, Ajita Kesakambalan said to me, Great King, there is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed. There is no fruit or result of good or bad actions. There is no this world, no next world, no mother, no father, no spontaneously reborn beings, no contemplatives or Brahmins who, faring rightly and practicing rightly, proclaim this world and the next after having directly known and realized it for themselves. A person is a composite of four primary elements. At death, the earth, in the body, returns to and merges with the external earth substance. The fire returns to and merges with the external fire substance. The liquid returns to and merges with the external liquid substance. The wind returns to and merges with the external wind substance. The sense faculties scatter into space. Four men, with the beer as the fifth, carry the corpse. Its eulogies are sounded only as far as the charnel ground. The bones turn pigeon-colored. The offerings end in ashes. Generosity is taught by idiots. The words of those who speak of existence after death are false, empty chatter. 
With the breakup of the body, the wise and the foolish alike are annihilated, destroyed. They do not exist after death. Thus, when asked about a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, Ajita Kesakambalan answered with annihilation. Just as if a person, when asked about a mango, were to answer with a breadfruit, or when asked about a breadfruit, were to answer with a mango. In the same way, when asked about a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, Ajita Kesakambalan answered with annihilation. The thought occurred to me, how can anyone like me think of disparaging a contemplative or Brahmin living in his realm? Yet I neither delighted in Ajita Kesakambalan's words, nor did I protest against them. Neither delighting nor protesting, I was dissatisfied. Without expressing dissatisfaction, without accepting his teaching, without adopting it, I got up from my seat and left. Another time, I approached Pakuda Kachayana, and, on arrival, exchanged courteous greetings with him. After an exchange of friendly greetings and courtesies, I sat to one side. As I was sitting there, I asked him, Venerable Kachayana, there are these common craftsmen, they live off the fruits of their crafts, visible in the here and now. Is it possible, venerable sir, to point out a similar fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now? When this was said, Pakuda Kachayana said to me, Great king, there are these seven substances, unmade, irreducible, uncreated, without a creator, barren, stable as a mountain peak, standing firm like a pillar, that do not alter, do not change, do not interfere with one another are incapable of causing one another pleasure, pain, or both pleasure and pain. Which seven? The earth substance, the liquid substance, the fire substance, the wind substance, pleasure, pain, and the soul as the seventh. These are the seven substances, unmade, irreducible, uncreated, without a creator, barren, stable as a mountain peak, standing firm like a pillar, that do not alter, do not change, do not interfere with one another, and are incapable of causing one another pleasure, pain, or both pleasure and pain and among them there is no killer nor one who causes killing, no hearer nor one who causes hearing, no cognizer nor one who causes cognition. When one cuts off another person's head, there is no one taking anyone's life. It is simply between the seven substances that the sword passes. Thus, when asked about a fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now, Pakuda Kachayana answered with non-relatedness. Just as if a person, when asked about a mango, were to answer with a breadfruit, or when asked about a breadfruit, were to answer with a mango. In the same way, when asked about a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, Pakuda Kachayana answered with non-relatedness. The thought occurred to me, how can anyone like me think of disparaging a contemplative or Brahmin living in his realm? Yet I neither delighted in Pakuda Kachayana's words, nor did I protest against them. Neither delighting nor protesting, I was dissatisfied. Without expressing dissatisfaction, without accepting his teaching, without adopting it, I got up from my seat and left. Another time, I approached Nigantha Nataputta, and on arrival, exchanged courteous greetings with him. After an exchange of friendly greetings and courtesies, I sat to one side. As I was sitting there, I asked him, Venerable Agivasana, there are these common craftsmen, they live off the fruits of their crafts, visible in the here and now. Is it possible, Venerable Sir, to point out a similar fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now? When this was said, Nigantha Nataputta said to me, Great King, there is the case where the Nigantha, the knotless one, is restrained with the fourfold restraint. And how is the Nigantha restrained with the fourfold restraint? There is the case where the Nigantha is obstructed by all waters, conjoined with all waters, cleansed by all waters, suffused with all waters. This is how the Nigantha is restrained with the fourfold restraint. When the Nigantha, a knotless one, is restrained with such a fourfold restraint, he is said to be a knotless one a son of Nata, with his self-perfected, his self-controlled, his self-established. Thus, when asked about a fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now, Nigantha Nataputta answered with fourfold restraint, just as if a person, when asked about a mango, were to answer with a breadfruit, or, when asked about a breadfruit, were to answer with a mango. In the same way, when asked about a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, Nigantha Nataputta answered with fourfold restraint. The thought occurred to me, how can anyone like me think of disparaging a contemplative or Brahmin living in his realm? Yet I neither delighted in Nagantha Nataputta's words, nor did I protest against them. Neither delighting nor protesting, I was dissatisfied. Without expressing dissatisfaction, without accepting his teaching, without adopting it, I got up from my seat and left. Another time, I approached Sanjaya Velataputta, and, on arrival, exchanged courteous greetings with him. After an exchange of friendly greetings and courtesies, I sat to one side. As I was sitting there, I asked him, Venerable Sanjaya, there are these common craftsmen, they live off the fruits of their crafts, visible in the here and now. 
Is it possible, venerable sir, to point out a similar fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now? When this was said, Sanjaya Vallataputta said to me, If you ask me if there exists another world after death, if I thought that there exists another world, would I declare that to you? I don't think so. I don't think in that way. I don't think otherwise. I don't think not. I don't think not not. If you ask me if there isn't another world, both is and isn't, neither is nor isn't. If there are beings who transmigrate, if there aren't, both are and aren't, neither are nor aren't. If the Tathagata exists after death, doesn't, both, neither exists nor exists after death, would I declare that to you? I don't think so. I don't think in that way. I don't think otherwise. I don't think not. I don't think not not. Thus, when asked about a fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now, Sanjaya Vallataputta answered with evasion, just as if a person, when asked about a mango, were to answer with a breadfruit, or, when asked about a breadfruit, were to answer with a mango. In the same way, when asked about the fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now, Sanjaya Vallataputta answered with evasion. The thought occurred to me, this, among these contemplative and Brahmins, is the most foolish and confused of all. How can he, when asked about a fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now, answer with evasion? Still the thought occurred to me, how can anyone like me think of disparaging a contemplative or Brahmin living in his realm? Yet I neither delighted in Sanjaya Vallataputta's words, nor did I protest against them. Neither delighting nor protesting, I was dissatisfied. Without expressing dissatisfaction, without accepting his teaching, Without adopting it, I got up from my seat and left. So, Lord, I asked the Blessed One as well. There are these common craftsmen. They live off the fruits of their crafts, visible in the here and now. They give happiness and pleasure to themselves, to their parents, wives and children, to their friends and colleagues. They put in place an excellent presentation of offerings to contemplatives and Brahmins, leading to heaven, resulting in happiness, conducive to a heavenly rebirth. Is it possible, Lord, to point out a similar fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now? Yes, it is, great king. But first, with regard to that, I will ask you a counter-question. Answer as you see fit. Suppose there were a man of yours, your slave, your workman, rising in the morning before you, going to bed in the evening only after you, doing whatever you order, always acting to please you, speaking politely to you, always watching for the look on your face. The thought would occur to him, isn't it amazing, isn't it astounding, the destination, the results of meritorious deeds? For this King Ajatasattu is a human being, and I too am a human being. Yet King Ajatasattu enjoys himself supplied and replete with the five strings of sensuality, like a deva, as it were, while I am his slave, his workman, always watching for the look on his face. I too should do meritorious deeds. What if I were to shave off my hair and beard, put on the yoker robes, and go forth from the household life into homelessness? So after some time he shaves off his hair and beard, puts on the ochre robes, and goes forth from the household life into homelessness. Having thus gone forth, he lives restrained in body, speech, and mind, content with the simplest food and shelter, delighting in solitude. Then suppose one of your men were to inform you, you should know, your majesty, that a man of yours, your slave, your workman, always watching for the look on your face, has gone forth from the household life into homelessness, content with the simplest food and shelter, delighting in solitude. Would you, thus informed, say, Bring that man back to me. Make him again be my slave, my workman, always watching for the look on my face. Not at all, Lord. Rather, I am the one who should bow down to him, rise up out of respect for him, invite him to a seat, invite him to accept gifts of robes, alms food, lodgings, and medicinal requisites for the sick, and I would provide him with righteous safety, defense, and protection. So what do you think, great king? With that being the case, is there a visible fruit of the contemplative life, or is there not? Yes, Lord. With that being the case, there certainly is a visible fruit of the contemplative life. This great king is the first fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now, that I point out to you. But is it possible, Lord, to point out yet another fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now? Yes, it is, great king. But first, with regard to that, I will ask you a counter-question. Answer however you please. Suppose there were a man of yours, a farmer, a householder, a taxpayer, swelling the royal treasury. The thought would occur to him, isn't it amazing, isn't it astounding, the destination, the results of meritorious deeds. For this King Ajatasattu is a human being, and I too am a human being. Yet King Ajatasattu enjoys himself supplied and replete with the five strings of sensuality. Like a deva, as it were, while I am a farmer, a householder, a taxpayer swelling the royal treasury. I too should do meritorious deeds. 
What if I were to shave off my hair and beard, put on the ochre robes, and go forth from the household life into homelessness? So after some time he abandons his massive wealth, large or small, leaves his circle of relatives, large or small, shaves off his hair and beard, puts on the ochre robes, and goes forth from the household life into homelessness. Having thus gone forth, he lives restrained in body, speech, and mind, content with the simplest food and shelter, delighting in solitude. Then suppose one of your men were to inform you, you should know, your majesty, that that man of yours, the farmer, the householder, the taxpayer swelling the royal treasury, has gone forth from the household life into homelessness, content with the simplest food and shelter, delighting in solitude. Would you, thus informed, say, bring that man back to me, make him again be a farmer, a householder, a taxpayer swelling the royal treasury? Not at all, Lord. Rather, I am the one who should bow down to him, rise up out of respect for him, invite him to a seat, invite him to accept gifts of robes, alms food, lodgings, and medicinal requisites for the sick, and I would provide him with righteous safety, defense, and protection. So what do you think, great king? With that being the case, is there a visible fruit of the contemplative life, or is there not? Yes, Lord. With that being the case, there certainly is a visible fruit of the contemplative life. This, great king, is the second fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now, that I point out to you. But is it possible, Lord, to point out yet another fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now? Yes, it is, great king. Listen and pay close attention. I will speak. There is the case, great king, where a Tathagata appears in the world, worthy and rightly self-awakened. He teaches the Dharma, admirable in its beginning, admirable in its middle, admirable in its end. He proclaims the holy life, both in its particulars and in its essence. Entirely perfect, surpassingly pure. A householder or householder's son, hearing the Dharma, gains conviction in the Tathagata and reflects, household life is confining, a dusty path. Life gone forth is the open air. It isn't easy living at home to practice the holy life totally perfect, totally pure, a polished shell. What if I, having shaved off my hair and beard and putting on the yoker robe, were to go forth from the household life into homelessness? So after some time he abandons his massive wealth, large or small, leaves his circle of relatives large or small, shaves off his hair and beard, puts on the ochre robes, and goes forth from the household life into homelessness. When he has thus gone forth, he lives restrained by the rules of the monastic code, seeing danger in the slightest faults, consummate in his virtue, he guards the doors of his senses, is possessed of mindfulness and alertness, and is content. And how is a monk consummate in virtue? Abandoning the taking of life, he abstains from the taking of life. He dwells with his rod laid down, his knife laid down, scrupulous, merciful, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. This is part of his virtue. Abandoning the taking of what is not given, he abstains from the taking of what is not given. He takes only what is given, accepts only what is given, lives not by stealth but by means of a self that has become pure. This too is part of his virtue. Abandoning uncelibacy, he lives a celibate life, aloof, restraining from a sexual act that is the villager's way. This too is part of his virtue. Abandoning false speech, he abstains from false speech. He speaks the truth, holds to the truth, is firm, reliable, no deceiver of the world. This too is part of his virtue. Abandoning divisive speech, he abstains from divisive speech. What he has heard here, he does not tell there, to break those people apart from those people here. What he has heard there, he does not tell here to break these people apart from those people there. Thus reconciling those who have broken apart, or cementing those who are united, he loves concord, delights in concord, enjoys concord, speaks things that create concord. This too is part of his virtue. Abandoning abusive speech, he abstains from abusive speech. He speaks words that are soothing to the ear, that are affectionate, that go to the heart, that are polite, appealing and pleasing to all people at large. This too is part of his virtue. Abandoning idle chatter, he abstains from idle chatter. He speaks in season, speaks what is factual, what is in accordance with the goal, the dharma, and the vinaya. He speaks words worth treasuring, seasonable, reasonable, circumscribed, connected with the goal. This too is part of his virtue. He abstains from damaging seed and plant life. He eats only once a day, refraining from the evening meal and from food at the wrong time of day. He abstains from dancing, singing, instrumental music, and from watching shows. He abstains from wearing garlands and from beautifying himself with scents and cosmetics. He abstains from high and luxurious beds and seats. He abstains from accepting gold and money. He abstains from accepting uncooked grain, raw meat, women and girls, male and female slaves, 
goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, steeds and mares, fields and property. He abstains from running messages, from buying and selling, from dealing with false scales, false metals, and false measures, from bribery, deception, and fraud. He abstains from mutilating, executing, imprisoning, highway robbery, plunder, and violence. This too is part of his virtue. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, remain addicted to damaging seed and plant life such as these, plants propagated from roots, stems, joints, buddings, and seeds, he abstains from damaging seed and plant life such as these. This too is part of his virtue. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, remain addicted to consuming stored up goods such as these, stored up food, stored up drinks, stored up clothing, stored up vehicles, stored up bedding, stored up scents, and stored up meat, he abstains from consuming stored up goods such as these. This too is a part of his virtue. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, remain addicted to watching shows such as these, dancing, singing, instrumental music, plays, ballad recitations, hand clapping, cymbals and drums, magic lantern scenes, acrobatic and conjuring tricks, elephant fights, horse fights, buffalo fights, bull fights, goat fights, ram fights, cock fights, quail fights, fighting with staves, boxing, wrestling, war games, roll calls, battle arrays, and regimental reviews. He abstains from watching shows such as these. This too is part of his virtue. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins living off food given in faith remain addicted to heedless and idle games such as these. Eight row chess, ten row chess, chess in the air, hopscotch, spillikins, dice, stick games, hand pictures, ball games, blowing through the toy pipes, playing with toy plows, turning somersaults, playing with toy windmills, toy measures, toy chariots, toy bows, guessing letters drawn in the air, guessing thoughts, mimicking deformities, he abstains from heedless and idle games such as these. This too is part of his virtue. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins living off food given in faith remain addicted to high and luxurious furnishings such as these. Oversized couches, couches adorned with carved animals, long-haired coverlets, multicolored patchwork coverlets, white woolen coverlets, woolen coverlets embroidered with flowers or animal figures, stuffed quilts, coverlets with fringe, silk coverlets embroidered with gems, large woolen carpets, elephant, horse, and chariot rugs, antelope hide rugs, deer hide rugs, couches with canopies, couches with red cushions for the head and feet. He abstains from using high and luxurious furnishings such as these. This too is part of his virtue. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, remain addicted to scents, cosmetics, and means of beautification such as these, rubbing powders into the body, massaging with oils, bathing in perfumed water, kneading the limbs, using mirrors, ointments, garlands, scents, creams, face powders, mascara, bracelets, headbands, decorated walking sticks, ornamented water bottles, swords, fancy sunshades, decorated sandals, turbans, gems, yak tail whisks, long fringed white robes. He abstains from using scents, cosmetics, and means of beautification such as these. This too is part of his virtue. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, remain addicted to talking about lowly topics such as these talking about kings, robbers, ministers of state, armies, alarms and battles, food and drink, clothing, furniture, garlands and scents, relatives, vehicles, villages, towns, cities, the countryside, women and heroes, the gossip of the street and the well, tales of the dead, tales of diversity on philosophical discussions of the past and future, the creation of the world and of the sea, and talk of whether things exist or not. He abstains from talking about lowly topics such as these. This too is part of his virtue. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, remain addicted to debates such as these. You understand this doctrine and discipline? I'm the one who understands this doctrine and discipline. How could you understand this doctrine and discipline? You are practicing wrongly. I'm practicing rightly. I'm being consistent. You are not. What should be said first, you said last. What should be said last, you said first. What you took so long to think out has been refuted. Your doctrine has been overthrown. You are defeated. Go and try to salvage your doctrine. Extricate yourself if you can. He abstains from debates such as these. This too is part of his virtue. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, remain addicted to running messages and errands for people such as these. Kings, ministers of state, noble warriors, Brahmins, householders, or youths, who say, Go here, go there, take this there, fetch that here. He abstains from running messages and errands for people such as these. This too is part of his virtue. 
whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, engage in scheming, persuading, hinting, belittling, and pursuing gain with gain, he abstains from forms and scheming and persuading, which are improper ways of trying to gain material support from donors, such as these. This too is part of his virtue. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, maintain themselves by wrong livelihood by such animal arts as reading marks on the limbs, reading omens and signs, interpreting celestial events, interpreting dreams, reading features of the body, reading marks on cloth gnawed by mice, offering fire oblations, oblations from a ladle, oblations of husks, rice powder, rice grains, ghee, and oil, offering oblations from the mouth, offering blood sacrifices, making predictions based on the fingertips, geomancy, making predictions for state officials, laying demons in a cemetery, placing spells on spirits, earth skills, snake skills, poison skills, scorpion skills, rat skills, bird skills, crow skills, predicting lifespans, giving protective charms, casting horoscopes, he abstains from wrong livelihood from animal arts such as these. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, maintain themselves by wrong livelihood by such animal arts as determining lucky and unlucky gems, staffs, garments, swords, arrows, bows, and other weapons, women, men, boys, girls, male slaves, female slaves, elephants, horses, buffaloes, bulls, cows, goats, rams, fowl, quails, lizards, rabbits, tortoises, and other animals, he abstains from wrong livelihood from animal arts such as these. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, maintain themselves by wrong livelihood by such animal arts as forecasting the rulers will march forth, the rulers will not march forth, our rulers will attack and their rulers will retreat, their rulers will attack and our rulers will retreat, there will be triumph for our rulers and defeat for their rulers, there will be triumph for their rulers and defeat for our rulers, thus there will be triumph for this one, defeat for that one, he abstains from wrong livelihood, from animal arts such as these. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, maintain themselves by wrong livelihood, by such animal arts as forecasting, there will be a lunar eclipse, there will be a solar eclipse, there will be an occultation of an asterism, the sun and moon will be favorable, the sun and moon will be unfavorable, the asterisms will be favorable, the asterisms will be unfavorable, there will be a meteor shower, there will be a flickering light on the horizon, there will be an earthquake, there will be thunder coming from dry clouds, there will be a rising, a setting, a darkening, a brightening of the sun, moon, and asterisms. Such will be the result of the lunar eclipse, the rising, setting, darkening, brightening of the sun, moon, and asterisms. He abstains from wrong livelihood, from animal arts such as these. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, maintain themselves by wrong livelihood, by such animal arts as forecasting, there will be abundant rain, there will be a drought, there will be plenty, there will be famine, there will be rest and security, there will be danger, there will be disease, there will be freedom from disease, or they earn their living by accounting, counting, calculation, composing poetry, or teaching hedonistic arts and doctrines. He abstains from wrong livelihood, from animal arts such as these. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, maintain themselves by wrong livelihood, by such animal arts as calculating auspicious dates for marriages, both those in which the bride is brought home and those in which she is sent out, calculating auspicious dates for betrothals and divorces, for collecting debts or making investments and loans, reciting charms to make people attractive or unattractive, curing women who have undergone miscarriages or abortions, reciting spells to bind a man's tongue, to paralyze his jaws, to make him lose control over his hands, or to bring on deafness, getting oracular answers to questions addressed to a spirit in a mirror, in a young girl, or to a spirit medium, worshipping the sun, worshipping the great Brahma, bringing forth flames from the mouth, invoking the goddess of luck, he abstains from wrong livelihood, from animal arts such as these. Whereas some contemplatives and Brahmins, living off food given in faith, maintain themselves by wrong livelihood, by animal arts such as promising gifts to deities in return for favors, fulfilling such promises, demonology, reciting spells in earth houses, inducing virility and impotence, preparing sites for construction, consecrating sites for construction, giving ceremonial mouthwashes and ceremonial baths, offering sacrificial fires, administering emetics, purges, purges from above, purges from below, head purges, ear oil, eye drops, treatments through the nose, ointments, and counter ointments, practicing eye surgery, general surgery, pediatrics, administering root medicines and binding medicinal herbs. He abstains from wrong livelihood, from animal arts such as these. This too is part of his virtue. And how does a monk guard the doors of his senses? On seeing a form with the eye, he does not grasp at any theme or details by which, 
If he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the eye, evil, unskillful qualities such as greed or distress might assail him. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an aroma with the nose, on tasting flavor with the tongue, on touching a tactile sensation with the body, on cognizing an idea with the intellect, he does not grasp at any theme or details by which, if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the intellect, evil, unskillful qualities, such as greed or distress, might assail him. Endowed with this noble restraint over the sense faculties, he is inwardly sensitive to the pleasure of being blameless. This is how a monk guards the doors of his senses. And how is a monk possessed of mindfulness and alertness? When going forward and returning, he makes himself alert. When looking toward and looking away, when bending and extending his limbs, when carrying his outer cloak, his upper robe, and his bowl, when eating, drinking, chewing, and tasting, when urinating and defecating, when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and remaining silent, he makes himself alert. This is how a monk is possessed of mindfulness and alertness. And how is a monk content? Just as a bird, wherever it goes, flies with its wings as its only burden, so too is he content with a set of robes to provide for his body, and alms food to provide for his hunger. Wherever he goes, he takes only his barest necessities along. This is how a monk is content. Endowed with this noble aggregate of virtue, this noble restraint over the sense faculties, this noble mindfulness and alertness, this noble contentment, he seeks out a secluded dwelling, a wilderness, the shade of a tree, a mountain, a glen, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a forest grove, the open air, a heap of straw. After his meal, returning from his alms round, he sits down, crosses his legs, holds his body erect, and brings mindfulness to the fore. Abandoning covetousness with regard to the world, he dwells with an awareness devoid of covetousness. He cleanses his mind of covetousness, abandoning ill will and anger. He dwells with an awareness devoid of ill will. Sympathetic with the welfare of all living beings, he cleanses his mind of ill will and anger. Abandoning sloth and drowsiness, he dwells with an awareness devoid of sloth and drowsiness. Mindful alert percipient of light. He cleanses his mind of sloth and drowsiness. Abandoning restlessness and anxiety, he dwells undisturbed, his mind inwardly stilled. He cleanses his mind of restlessness and anxiety. Abandoning uncertainty, he dwells having crossed over uncertainty, with no perplexity, with regard to skillful qualities. He cleanses his mind of uncertainty. Suppose that a man, taking a loan, invests it in his business affairs. His business affairs succeed. He repays his old debts, and there is extra left over for maintaining his wife. The thought would occur to him, before taking a loan, I invested in my business affairs. Now my business affairs have succeeded. I have repaid my old debts and there is extra left over for maintaining my wife. Because of that, he would experience joy and happiness. Now suppose a man falls sick, in pain and seriously ill. He does not enjoy his meals and there is no strength in his body. As time passes, he eventually recovers from that sickness. He enjoys his meals and there is strength in his body. The thought would occur to him, before I was sick. Now I am recovered from that sickness. I enjoy my meals and there is strength in my body. Because of that, he would experience joy and happiness. Now suppose that a man is bound in prison. As time passes, he eventually is released from that bondage, safe and sound, with no loss of property. The thought would occur to him, before I was bound in prison, now I am released from that bondage, safe and sound, with no loss of my property. Because of that, he would experience joy and happiness. Now suppose that a man is a slave, subject to others, not subject to himself unable to go where he likes. As time passes, he eventually is released from that slavery, subject to himself, not subject to others, freed, able to go where he likes. The thought would occur to him, before I was a slave, now I am released from that slavery, subject to myself, not subject to others, freed, able to go where I like. Because of that, he would experience joy and happiness. Now suppose that a man, carrying money and goods, is traveling by a road through desolate country. As time passes, he eventually emerges from that desolate country, safe and sound, with no loss of property. The thought would occur to him, before, carrying money and goods, I was traveling by a road through desolate country. Now I have emerged from the desolate country, safe and sound, with no loss of my property. Because of that, he would experience joy and happiness. In the same way, when these five hindrances are not abandoned in himself, the monk regards it as a debt, a sickness, a prison, slavery, a road through desolate country. But when these five hindrances are abandoned in himself, he regards it as unindebtedness, good health, release from prison, freedom, a place of security. When he sees that they have been abandoned within him, gladness is born. In one who is gladdened, rapture is born. Enraptured at heart, his body grows calm. His body calm, he is sensitive to pleasure. Feeling pleasure, his mind becomes concentrated. Quite secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful qualities, 
he enters and remains in the first jhana, rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. He permeates and pervades, suffuses and fills this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Just as if a dexterous bathman or bathman's apprentice would pour bath powder into a brass basin and knead it together, sprinkling it again and again with water, so that this ball of bath powder, saturated, moisture-laden, permeated within and without, would nevertheless not drip. Even so, the monk permeates this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. There is nothing of his entire body unpervaded by rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. This is a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, more excellent than the previous ones and more sublime. Then, with the stilling of directed thoughts and evaluations, he enters and remains in the second jhana, rapture and pleasure born of concentration, unification of awareness free from directed thought and evaluation, internal assurance. He permeates and pervades, suffuses and filled this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of concentration, just like a lake with spring water welling up from within, having no inflow from the east, west, north, or south, and with the sky supplying abundant showers time and time again, so that the cool fount of water welling up from within the lake would permeate and pervade, suffuse and fill it with cool waters, there being no part of the lake unpervaded by the cool waters, even so the monk permeates this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of concentration. There is nothing of his entire body unpervaded by rapture and pleasure born of concentration. This too is a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, more excellent than the previous ones and more sublime. And then, with the fading of rapture, he remains equanimous, mindful and alert, and senses pleasure with the body. He enters and remains in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, equanimous and mindful, he has a pleasant abiding. He permeates and pervades, suffuses and fills this very body with the pleasure divested of rapture. Just as in a lotus pond, some of the lotuses, born and growing in the water, stay immersed in the water and flourish without standing up out of the water, so that they are permeated and pervaded, suffused and filled with cool water from their roots to their tips, and nothing of those lotuses would be unpervaded with cool water. Even so, the monk permeates this very body with the pleasure divested of rapture. This too is a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, more excellent than the previous ones and more sublime. And then, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, as with the earlier disappearance of elation and distress, he enters and remains in the fourth jhana, purity of equanimity and mindfulness neither pleasure nor pain. He sits permeating the body with a pure, bright awareness, just as if a man were sitting covered from head to foot with a white cloth so that there will be no part of his body to which the white cloth did not extend. Even so, the monk sits, permeating the body with a pure, bright awareness. There is nothing of his entire body unpervaded by pure, bright awareness. This too, great king, is a fruit of the contemplative life, visible in the here and now, more excellent than the previous ones and more sublime. With his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to knowledge and vision. He discerns, this body of mind is endowed with form, composed of the four primary elements, born from mother and father, nourished with rice and porridge, subject to inconstancy, rubbing, pressing, dissolution, and dispersion. And this consciousness of mine is supported here and bound up here, just as if there were a beautiful barrel gem of the purest water, eight-faceted, well-polished, clear, limpid, consummate in all its aspects, and going through the middle of it was a blue, yellow, red, white, or brown thread, and a man with good eyesight, taking it in his hand, were to reflect on it thus. This is a beautiful barrel gem of the purest water, eight-faceted, well-polished, clear, limpid, consummate in all its aspects, and this, going through the middle of it, is a blue, yellow, red, white, or brown thread. In the same way, with his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the monk directs and inclines it to knowledge and vision. He discerns, this body of mind is endowed with form, composed of the four primary elements, born from mother and father, nourished with rice and porridge, subject to inconstancy, rubbing, pressing, dissolution, and dispersion. And this consciousness of mind is supported here and bound up here. This too, great king, is a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, more excellent than the previous ones and more sublime. With his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to creating a mind-made body. From this body he creates another body, endowed with form, made of the mind, complete in all its parts, not inferior in its faculties, just as if a man were to draw a reed from its sheath. The thought would occur to him, this is the sheath, this is the reed. The sheath is the one thing, the reed another, but the reed has been drawn out from the sheath. 
or as if a man were to draw a sword from its scabbard. The thought would occur to him, this is the sword, this is the scabbard. The sword is the one thing, the scabbard another, but the sword has been drawn out from the scabbard. Or as if a man were to pull out a snake from its slough, this is the snake, this is the slough. The snake is one thing, the slough another, but the snake has been pulled out from the slough. In the same way, with his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the monk directs and inclines it to creating a mind-made body. From this body he creates another body, endowed with form, made of the mind, complete in all its parts, not inferior in its faculties. This too, great king, is a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, more excellent than the previous ones, and more sublime. With his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the modes of supernormal powers. He wields manifold supernormal powers. Having been one, he becomes many. Having been many, he becomes one. He appears, he vanishes. He goes unimpeded through walls, ramparts, and mountains, as if through space. He dives in and out of the earth as if it were water. He walks on water without sinking as if it were dry land. Sitting cross-legged, he flies through the air like a winged bird. With his hand, he touches and strokes even the sun and moon, so mighty and powerful. He exercises influence with his body even as far as the Brahma worlds. Just as a dexterous potter or his assistant could craft from well-prepared clay whatever kind of pottery vessel he likes, or as a dexterous ivory carver or his assistant could craft from a well-prepared ivory any kind of ivory work he likes, or as a dexterous goldsmith or his assistant could craft from well-prepared gold any kind of gold article he likes. In the same way, with his mind thus concentrated, purified, and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the monk directs and inclines it to the modes of supernormal powers. He exercises influence with his body even as far as the Brahma worlds. This too, great king, is a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, more excellent than the previous ones, and more sublime. With his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the divine ear element. He hears, by means of the divine ear element, purified and surpassing the human, both kinds of sounds, divine and human, whether near or far. Just as if a man traveling along a highway were to hear the sounds of kettle drums, small drums, conches, cymbals, and tom-toms, he would know, that is the sound of kettle drums, that is the sound of small drums, that is the sound of conches, that is the sound of cymbals, and that is the sound of tom-toms. In the same way, with his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the monk directs and inclines it to the divine ear element. He hears, by means of the divine ear element, purified and surpassing the human, both kinds of sounds, divine and human, whether near or far. This too, great king, is a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, more excellent than the previous ones, and more sublime. With his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to knowledge of the awareness of other beings. He discerns the awareness of other beings, other individuals, having encompassed it with his own awareness. He discerns a mind with passion as a mind with passion, and a mind without passion as a mind without passion. He discerns a mind with aversion as a mind with aversion, and a mind without aversion as a mind without aversion. He discerns a mind with delusion as a mind with delusion, and a mind without delusion as a mind without delusion. He discerns a restricted mind as a restricted mind, and a scattered mind as a scattered mind. He discerns an enlarged mind as an enlarged mind, and an unenlarged mind as an unenlarged mind. He discerns a surpassed mind one that is not at the most excellent level as a surpassed mind, and an unsurpassed mind as an unsurpassed mind. He discerns a concentrated mind as a concentrated mind, and an unconcentrated mind as an unconcentrated mind. He discerns a released mind as a released mind, and an unreleased mind as an unreleased mind. Just as if a young woman or man, fond of ornaments, examining the reflection of her own face in a bright mirror or bowl of clear water would know, blemished if it were blemished, or unblemished if it were not. In the same way, with his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the monk directs and inclines it to knowledge of the awareness of other beings. He discerns the awareness of other beings, other individuals, having encompassed it with his own awareness. He discerns a mind with passion as a mind with passion, and a mind without passion as a mind without passion. 
a released mind as a released mind, and an unreleased mind as an unreleased mind. This too, great king, is a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, and more excellent than the previous ones, and more sublime. With his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. He recollects his manifold past lives, one birth, two births, three births, four, five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, one hundred, one thousand, one hundred thousand, many eons of cosmic contraction, many eons of cosmic expansion, many eons of cosmic contraction and expansion, recollecting, there I had such a name, belonged to such a clan, had such an appearance, such was my food, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such the end of my life. Passing away from that state, I re-arose there, there too I had such a name, belonged to such a clan, had such an appearance, such was my food, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such the end of my life. Passing away from that state, I re-arose here. Thus he recollects his manifold past lives in their modes and details, just as if a man were to go from his home village to another village, and then from that village to yet another village, and then from that village back to his home village. The thought would occur to him, I went from my home village to that village over there. There I stood in such a way, sat in such a way, talked in such a way, and remained silent in such a way. From that village I went to that village over there, and there I stood in such a way, sat in such a way, talked in such a way, and remained silent in such a way. From that village I came back home. In the same way, with his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady and attained to imperturbability, the monk directs and inclines it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. He recollects his manifold past lives, in their modes and details. This too, great king, is a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, more excellent than the previous ones, and more sublime. With his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. He sees, by means of the divine eye, purified and surpassing the human, beings passing away and reappearing, and he discerns how they are inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate in accordance with their karma. These beings, who were endowed with bad conduct of body, speech, and mind, who reviled the noble ones, held wrong views and undertook actions under the influence of wrong views, with the breakup of the body after death, have reappeared in a plane of deprivation, a bad destination, a lower realm, hell. But these beings, who were endowed with good conduct of body, speech, and mind, who did not revile the noble ones, who held right views and undertook actions under the influence of right views, with the breakup of the body after death, have reappeared in a good destination, a heavenly world. Thus, by means of the divine eye, purified and surpassing the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, and he discerns how they are inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate in accordance with their karma. Just as if there are a tall building in the central square of a town, and a man with good eyesight standing on top of it were to see people entering a house, leaving it, walking along the street, and sitting in the central square, the thought would occur to him, these people are entering a house, leaving it, walking along the streets, and sitting in the central square. In the same way, with his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady and attained to imperturbability, the monk directs and inclines it to knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. He sees by means of the divine eye, purified and surpassing the human, beings passing away and reappearing, and he discerns how they are inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, in accordance with their karma. This too, great king, is a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, more excellent than the previous ones, and more sublime. With his mind thus concentrated and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the monk directs it to the knowledge of the ending of effluence. He discerns, as it has come to be, that this is stress, this is the origination of stress, this is the cessation of stress, this is the way leading to the cessation of stress. These are effluence. This is the origination of effluence. This is the cessation of effluence. This is the way leading to the cessation of effluence. His heart, thus knowing, thus seeing, is released from the effluent of sensuality, the effluent of becoming, the effluent of ignorance. With release, there is the knowledge released. He discerns that birth is ended, the holy life fulfilled, the task done. There is nothing further for this world. Just as if there were a pool of water in a mountain glen, clear, limpid, and unsullied, where a man with good eyesight standing on the bank could see shells, gravel and pebbles, and also shoals of fish swimming about and resting, and it would occur to him, this pool of water is clear, limpid and unsullied. 
Here are these shells, gravel and pebbles, and also these shoals of fish swimming about and resting. In the same way, with his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the monk directs and inclines it to the knowledge of the ending of effluence. He discerns, as it has come to be, that this is stress, this is the origination of stress, this is the cessation of stress, this is the way leading to the cessation of stress, these are effluents, this is the origination of effluence, this is the cessation of effluence, this is the way leading to the cessation of effluence. His heart, thus knowing, thus seeing, is released from the effluent of sensuality, the effluent of becoming, the effluent of ignorance. With release, there is the knowledge released. He discerns that birth is ended, the holy life fulfilled, the task done. There is nothing further for this world. This too, great king, is a fruit of the contemplative life, visible here and now, more excellent than the previous ones and more sublime. And as for another visible fruit of the contemplative life, higher and more sublime than this, there is none. When this was said, King Ajatasattu said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Lord, Magnificent, just as if he were to place upright what was overturned, to reveal what was hidden, to show the way to one who was lost, or to carry a lamp into the dark so that those with eyes could see forms, in the same way has the Blessed One, through many lines of reasoning, made the Dharma clear. I go to the Blessed One for refuge, to the Dharma, and to the Sangha of monks. May the Blessed One remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge, from this day forward for life. A transgression has overcome me, Lord, in that I was so foolish, so muddle-headed, so unskilled as to kill my father, a righteous man, a righteous king, for the sake of sovereign rulership. May the Blessed One please accept this confession of my transgression, as such, so that I may restrain myself in the future. Yes, great king, a transgression overcame you in that you were so foolish, so muddle-headed, and so unskilled as to kill your father, a righteous man, a righteous king, for the sake of sovereign rulership. But because you see your transgression as such, and make amends in accordance with the Dharma, we accept your confession. For it is a cause of growth in the discipline of the noble ones when, seeing a transgression as such, one makes amends in accordance with the Dharma and exercises restraint in the future. When this was said, King Ajatasattu said to the Blessed One, Well then, Lord, I am now taking leave. Many are my duties, many my responsibilities. Then do, great king, what you think it is now time to do. So King Ajatasattu, delighting and rejoicing in the Blessed One's words, rose from his seat, bowed down to him, and, after circumambulating him, left. Not long after King Ajatasattu had left, the Blessed One addressed the monks, saying, The king is wounded, monks. The king is incapacitated. Had he not killed his father, that righteous man, that righteous king, the dustless, stainless Dharma eye would have arisen in him as he sat in this very seat. That is what the Blessed One said. Gratified, the monks delighted in the Blessed One's words. All right, that was the Samana Pala Sutta. Docs, any questions? Several. So let's get into them. So first of all, this is still Bimbisara and Ajatasattu. So this is, it seems like the idea is that this is Ajatasattu's uh, first visit with the Buddha, but haven't, hasn't he met the Buddha in previous suttas that we've read? Is this just... Are these just players that get reset between each sutta, or what's going on there? That's a good question. This is actually the first sutta where King Ajatasattu meets the Buddha. So all sutras that we've dealt with where he's a character after this one, he's already been a lay follower of the Buddha before. So this is kind of the the origin of their relationship. Okay. Right, and we're not necessarily reading these in order, so that makes sense. So this is the first one for them. I remember also we're talking about, in this, talking about people who have renounced. In a previous episode, we talked about how generally it's it's not like the first sons who are renouncing. Um, whereas in this sutta, it seems like anyone can renounce. Is that intentional? Am I misreading? Um, or is this like the Buddha saying, hey, anyone should be able to renounce in contrast to what the rest of society is saying? That's also a good question. And it's important to put in context the severe changes that we see to early Indian society 
that take place during the life of the Buddha in part because of his movement. So we've talked about in the past how in pre-Buddhist Brahmanical Hindu society, there is a prescribed trajectory that one's life takes based on their caste, their social position, and based on their age and their phase of life. And renunciation was something that happened late in life after one has has raised a family and has perfected their career and is on into their retirement. So all the renunciants that the Buddha talks to are old guys. They are people who have renounced in their old age and they've left their families and their descendants and their careers behind. But the Buddha, as we've talked about, he encourages renunciation at any stage in life, at any social class. Renunciation was something that poorer castes could not do regardless of their age, because they were slaves, or they were untouchables, or they fulfilled some sort of critical role to the community and society that prevented them from being able to leave it. So in this case, all of these renunciants are from somewhat privileged backgrounds, but they've renounced in their old age, and they have decided on these philosophies. However, just because they've renounced doesn't mean they don't interact with society in an important way. As we can see in this sutta, for example, whenever a king wants to hear a sermon, hear a doctrine, or hear something to change the way that he thinks about his life, he will seek out these renunciants wherever they are and make offerings to them and listen to what they say. So that's kind of the function that these renunciants play in society at the time. Before the Buddha comes in and says, you can renounce at any time, you should renounce whenever you can, right now, if possible. And you don't have to be privileged, wealthy. You can do it anytime. Okay, makes sense. So the observation that I had was correct, and the Buddha is kind of trying to push against said view. Right. And the women in the pre-Buddhist Hindu society didn't do any renouncing at all, right? So when we're talking about this renunciant class of older men, it's all men. The women, they either just die or they are alone or something like that. They don't get they don't get the privilege to be able to just leave everything behind and just go. In early Buddhism, that's also the case, right? We know that nuns don't become a thing until until about the middle-ish of the Buddha's preaching career, but um, they do eventually. Nuns do become a thing. And so in a lot of ways, scholars have argued that the Buddhist social movement or the Buddhist religious movement was pushing against sort of the strict societal structure that was imposed by the Brahmanical philosophy of the time. I imagine with women, given how misogynist the times were, even if a woman had renounced, like, no one would listen to her, I, I suspect. Right. It's a very misogynist time. And in fact, there were these pathways for the men to follow, right? Where first phase of their life, their students, second phase, their career people and raising families, third phase they are kind of moving towards retirement, fourth phase they renounce. For women, those phases are defined by who they ought to listen to. Right. Listen to their father, second phase, listen to the husband, third phase, listen to the sons. Right, exactly. So I know we've encountered that somewhere before. I don't remember where exactly. Yeah, and that's nothing fun. Misogynist is all hell. Yeah, it was also 2,000 years ago, so what are you going to do? Right. So let's move on to the renunciants that Ajatasattu talks to. So the first one is Purana Kasapa. Again, is that right? Yeah. All right, so this is non-action. So Kasapa's basic argument is that it's all the same, that doing evil things is not actually evil. It's like this is kind of a moral relativism slash morality is not important kind of idea. That's right. He fully denies that there is any sort of recompense for anything that anybody does. So if you do good, it's not like you get good in return, but you also don't even get bad. There is no causal relationship between the things that happen to you and the things that you have done or that you regularly do. So. In addition to being a moralism, it's also a specific cosmology. We've talked about how in Buddhism, causation factors into reincarnation directly. So wherever you're reborn or however you're reborn, 
is directly linked to what you've done in the past. And where you go in the future is directly linked to what happens to you now and what you do now. In Purana Kashyapa's philosophy, there's really no relationship. It's not only kind of randomness, but it's also kind of, like he says, amoralism. There's no payback for any actions. There's no punishment or reward for good or bad deeds. You're just kind of existing and whatever happens to you is the randomness of the universe. So all of the renunciants that are talked to other than the Buddha come off a bit as a straw man, but that could be a matter of like, maybe this kind of philosophy was being very seriously pushed and uh, talked about at the time, or is this a matter, the suttas have a bad habit of taking down opposite arguments with straw men. And it seems like that's going on here as well. But also it could be a matter of, no, this is what they were actually saying then. I think that there is a little bit of a straw man problem. Because obviously the, the Buddha wants to make his argument be the one on top in the suttas. He doesn't want people to, right. like, when he's preaching, he doesn't want people to listen to the account of Ajatasattu's encounter with Purana Kashyapa and be like, huh, he's actually got it right. But there is a system and a structure to how these arguments are presented, and it's actually pretty well thought out, in my opinion, how, from an argumentative and rhetorical standpoint, it's actually shown to us what these people are saying. So we have some evidence that corroborates that these people that we're hearing from, these renunciants, whether they were actual historical teachers or not, some were, some were not, they actually were representative of views in the sutta of prevailing views at the time among different kinds of renunciants in different regions that the Buddha would have encountered and would have had to argue against. So they are sort of selected carefully so that not only are they addressing something that's out there at the time to the audiences who would be listening to it, but they're also addressing it in a systematic fashion as to make a hierarchy out of them. So the first one is presented as like the most wrong. Going up from there, the arguments get progressively more close to what the Buddha is going to say is the truth, but they still are all kind of wrong in their own way. It's interesting then that Ajatasattu comments that the last one, the one that is the most like the Buddhist idea, which I agree with it is, but he also notes that it is the most misguided. The uh, final one, evasion, it's the translation we're using puts up there. Evasion is mentioned as specifically the most confused. It is, yeah. And there's we can get into the reasons for that whenever we get to that discussion. But I, I also think that that's fascinating because it shows something about Ajatasattu and about what he wants the Buddha to think about him. Yeah. So let's get back to doing these more or less in order. So after Purana Kasapa, there is Mikali Gosala. That's right, Makali Gosala. Makali Gosala. And the translation calls this purification through wandering on. He starts off with, here's a billion different numbers. Just here numbers. Some of them are very large. They're coming at you very quickly. Here they are. Let's move on. And then the actual argument is, through this morality and a bunch of other things, I will ripen unripened karma and eliminate ripened karma whenever touched by it. This is impossible. Pleasure and pain are measured out. The wandering on is fixed in its limits. So this is more, this is kind of a fatalistic view, kind of a everything is fate view, it seems like. That's right. Yeah. And in fact, the table that you get whenever you look up these six renunciants online actually argues that this is fatalism. He's saying that all suffering that we exist is predestined, measured out, and is set to happen. And so we just have to keep going. I think that what's important about these renunciants is that they're answering each of them the question of why does suffering exist, which is odd because King Ajatasattu asks them, what's the fruit of the contemplative life? Like, why should one renounce? And they say, here are X, Y, and Z reasons for why suffering exists. Very strange. Yeah. And he actually mentions that. He's like, when asked about a mango, they answered with a breadfruit. And right. so 
But I think that that's also deliberate for a couple of reasons. But anyways, he's saying there is no cause for suffering. Like, it's not me. It's not you. There's no... It just is. Yeah, there's no ripening or unripening. There's no control we have over it. Suffering is going to happen. And the answer to it is to just keep going. And so I think that that's interesting compared to the last one. Because the last one is trying to deal with the fact that people who ask this question of why is there suffering, they're, they're looking for uh, a morality, an ethic. And the first guy says, there isn't one. And the second guy says, even if there was one, it doesn't make a difference at all. Suffering is going to happen regardless. So next there is Ajita Kasakamam, Kasakambale. Close, yeah. Kasakambalin. Ajita Kesakambali. Kesakambali. Bali or Balin? Bali. Bali, okay. And this guy's deal seems to be that reality isn't actually real. Like, there is no fruit of result of good or bad actions. There is no this world, no next world, no mother, no father, no spontaneously reborn beings. So... This is like reality is an illusion, that this isn't real. Yeah, it's really interesting. So before we had these questions, which kind of were embedded with this bias toward or against a sort of ethic or morality system, but this guy is addressing something else. So if there's no morality, if there's no ethic, then what about afterlife? What about this reality and whatever happens after death? What about cosmology? And he essentially says there is no cosmology. There is no afterlife. There is no here and there. All we have is what's going on right now. And so the answer to suffering doesn't have anything to do with what is material and what is sensory and what is in front of us. And it also doesn't have to do with what is extrasensory or beyond the senses. It's just what we are doing right now. So the answer to suffering that he provides is in ignorance of any sort of cosmology or afterlife, live happily. Because when you die, the illusion stops, the television switches off, and everything that's on the screen just goes away because it was never really there in the first place. So it's fascinating because this is kind of like a it's kind of like an argument for emptiness that gets wrong halfway through. You know what I mean? At least if we're looking yeah. at right as being the Buddhist argument for emptiness. If you're a Buddhist and you're reading this, you're like, he started off correct with emptiness, but then in the middle, he just kind of hit a wall. And so it's fascinating that he's the third one out of six, because he is the one who's first now starting to get close to what the Buddha is having Ajatasattu think about. This is kind of equivalent to a modern day atheist then. Like this is like the world is what we can see and there is nothing after it. Yes. Yeah. In fact, they classify him as materialist because all we have is what's in front of us, what's accessible to the senses. And of course, the difference is that the argument is that the senses are illusory with this guy and with actual materialists in the real world. The argument is that they are limited, but they're not showing us holograms. He's saying they're showing us holograms. And so he's saying we only have what is available to the senses. That's what materialists say. But he's also saying they're showing us holograms and that we should just enjoy the hologram. All right. So next one in the line is Pakuda. Uh, would that be Kachayana? That's right. Pakuda Kachayana. The article calls this non-related and it seems quite similar to the previous one. Basically, everything are the seven substances, and then he goes through earth substance, liquid substance, fire elements, basically. Pleasure, pain, and the soul. So, these are the seven components of existence, and the, these are unmade, irreducible, uncreated, without a creator, barren, stable as a mountain peak, standing firm like a pillar. So, this is... Starting from a similar spot, whereas, like, here are the way things are, but he is moving on to a version of it where 
he's talking a version of it that doesn't change. Like in this version, these do not alter, do not change are his specific words. So things are the way they are and there's not much you can do about it. It is simply between the seven substances that the sword passes when talking about cutting off someone's head. So it's like, it's all just matter. And because it's all just stuff, it doesn't, there's not really a morality in there. That's right. Yeah, that's that's a good summary of what he's got going on. So he had, he's very similar to the materialist guy, Ajita Kesakambali. But he's different in that he doesn't say that all that stuff is illusory. He doesn't even really address the existence of sense faculties, the ability to sense these components of matter that he talks about. And this guy is one of my favorite because it's really hard to think through what he's actually arguing and make it make yeah. sense with the evidence we have in front of us. This idea that the seven elements do not interact or change each other, that they just come together and separate, is an early form of what we might call atomism, right? There's this yeah. idea that there's infinitely small components of matter which themselves are unchanging and unchanged and have always been and will always be and they just come together and change and that's how we see different states of how things are uh, this is not atomism necessarily because in atomism there's way more components he's only naming seven but here it's it's fascinating that they're the pillars of experience the pillars of reality and he's saying there is no morality there's no emptiness there's no eternity there's no afterlife, like all this stuff that we just keep coming up with is all made up. It's all kind of fog around these seven pillars. And these seven pillars don't change, don't interact. They often call this guy the eternalist, or he's arguing for eternalism, because he says that no matter what happens in our daily life experience, there are these seven things, there always have been these seven things, and there always will be these seven things. And so he started from the same place as the last guy, but what he, where he ended up was basically the opposite of impermanence. Right. Okay, so next was Naginta Anataputa? The second part was right. It's Nigantha. Nigantha. Nigantha Nataputa. And the, the translation list this says fourfold restraint, and this one went over my head. I didn't get this one. Yeah, this is an interesting one. This is one of the few times where we see actually another major religious movement other than the Brahmanical society that Buddhism existed in and Buddhism itself. Here we actually see Jainism. This character, Nigantha Nataputta, that's actually a title in Jainism. And so we're seeing a representative of people who practice Jainism. And their argument is that and this is not covered in the sutta, I'm offering background so that what he's saying makes a little more sense. In Jainism, karma is like a heavy, dark, or even like black matter that weighs down the soul. And you have to observe absolute restraint in your actions in order to cleanse your soul and free yourself from karma and thus achieve liberation of some kind. So these restraints that he does, these fourfold restraints, these are all basically like ways to act a karmically. So he's saying that the way to cleanse oneself of evil and to avoid evil is to not do these certain things. So Jainism is a really interesting character in this specific hierarchy and this specific setup because the Jains existed at the same time as the Buddha and they were absolutely in dialogue and we just don't often see them in dialogue. Jainism is fascinating because they are so concerned with acting a karmically, they will only eat vegan diets or vegetarian diets. They will wear special masks around their face so that they're not breathing in or breathing out microorganisms. They will only drink so much water and eat so much food per day because they want to make sure that there's enough food for all other living things. They'll sweep the ground in front of them to get all of the bugs and all of the microorganisms out of their way so they don't step on them and kill them. It's extreme moral restraint for the purpose of getting rid of karma. So the last guy said, 
there was no karma. There is no such thing as karma. But we're working up to what the Buddha is going to say. And so we need to bring karma back into the conversation. However, of course, Buddhism disagrees with Jainism in that, obviously, Buddhism doesn't regard karma as an actual substance. And they also don't argue that you should do all of that. They don't argue that you have to wear a mask, measure out your food and drink. This is, in the Buddhist perspective, one extreme of the middle way. Jainism is on one end, absolute restraint. And then on another is maybe like the materialism guy, Ajita Kesa Kambali, absolute indulgence. And so we're working our way to the middle by oscillating between these two extremes. But this is a really interesting historical presentation of Jainism that they actually don't really get much of in the Jain texts themselves. So this is really cool that this is in here. Okay, so that makes this make a lot more sense. So would Jainism lead to like the extreme ascetics, the folks who you know starve themselves and all of that? It can, it can, yeah. There are some Brahmanical traditions which argue that those extreme actions or these extreme austerities will build up like a spiritual heat or spiritual power that helps them achieve liberation or helps them in their future rebirths and so on. And so I'm sure that we've all seen or heard the example of this man who held his right arm above his head for like 50 years. If you haven't, you should look it up. Um, it's very fascinating. His argument in the Hindu tradition was that by doing this, he's improving his lot in the future. He's building up spiritual power because it takes a lot of effort and energy to maintain something like that. That's not Jainism necessarily. However, in Jainism, there are people who they will observe fasting, they'll observe all of these kind of extreme restraints in some cases for different reasons, maybe in a ritual setting or maybe as just an austerity practice. But for the most part, really, they actually are just very specific about the food they eat and how they move in the world and how they breathe and how they live in relation to all other all other living beings. Okay. So glad I have that extra info then because like I said, when I read this, I just it didn't translate. It was it was clearly like this is something specific that I don't know. And now I do know. So, uh, last step, evasion, preached by Sanjaya Velatthaputta, correct-ish? Yeah, Sanjaya Velatthaputta. Velatthaputta, okay. And this guy's just confused, it looks like. Clearly, he has, knows something, but isn't able to convey it well. Like, this seems like somebody who... It's like the problem isn't necessarily that they don't know anything. It's that they don't know how to convey what they're, go what they're thinking. I think that's a good impression to make of what he's about. It's kind of funny because the title for his ideology given in Sanskrit is Ajana, which is the absence of jhana. Like in English and in Sanskrit, the prefix a or an indicates like a negative. Amoralism is the absence of morality. Ajana is the absence of jhana, which is wisdom or insight. So I think that that title indicates that maybe they want us to think that he doesn't know anything at all. He has no insight whatsoever. But it seems like he does, but it's just kind of ineffable to him. If he had said, I just simply don't know and I live in this world where I don't know and that's fine, it would be one thing, but he does what's called a suspension of judgment. So he's asked a question that he doesn't want to answer or that he will not answer. He refuses to answer. And that's, that's something that the Buddha does sometimes. Whenever people ask the Buddha about the origins of the cosmos or the end of the, of the cosmos, he doesn't answer them at all. And so there's a chance that this guy does know a little bit of something. Yeah. Like some of this looks like non-dualism not quite ready yet like this guy is coming to non-dualism but tripped along the way and hasn't made it all the way yet i would agree there and it's fascinating i think that in english people have classified his movement his idea as agnosticism yeah when we were first choosing which suit to to read i chose this one because you mentioned it having an agnostic view and 
a rebuttal to agnosticism. That's not really what's going on here. Agnosticism is just saying, I don't know. And this guy's final words are, I don't think so. I don't think in that way. I don't think otherwise. I don't think not. I don't think not not. Like, that's, that's not, I don't know. That's, I can't explain. Exactly, yeah. And it's also kind of, it's kind of the matured view of emptiness that we started with a while ago. This kind of emptiness that was planted into another one of the guys has kind of matured a little bit to the point where this guy understands that if he thinks something, he doesn't know it. And if he knows it, he doesn't know it. But he also is not free of thinking or free of knowing. So classifying this as agnosticism doesn't answer any questions at all. It doesn't answer the question that Ajatasattu poses, and it doesn't answer the question of what is the root of suffering. It's, it doesn't answer the question of what is reality or what should we do or anything like that. He just basically says, I'm not going to say. And so I guess like in the frame narrative, the wisdom that he intended for Ajatasattu to get from him was to not think about it. And maybe that's why they've interpreted this as agnosticism. It's the absence of gnosis and the idea of gnosis being insight into how the divine world works, some sort of knowledge about how things go, same as jhana. And so maybe he's just trying to say, like, don't try for that. Don't rely on that for how you think about the world or the universe or suffering. Don't even think about those things, but also don't not think about them. He's also kind of emptying out the idea of like of like knowing and a mind and so on. It's almost Yogacara in nature, this argument. This idea that there's not really a reality in front of you, but there is. And you shouldn't not believe in the reality in front of you, but you also shouldn't believe in it so hard that you misunderstand it. You should strike a balance. However, we're going to see in a moment that as you say, Ajatasattu says, this is the stupidest one of all. And I understand why, because what he said makes the least apparent sense of the other five. Like, I didn't understand uh, Nigantha's argument, but the context that that's Jainism in mind, that one makes sense. So the others actually have an answer. It's not the answer he's looking for, and it is not the an answer to the question he asked. But the other five give an answer, whereas... Sanjaya is just not answering and sounding very confused and conflicted as he gives that non-answer. So, in a vacuum, yes, this is the weakest answer of the six. Yeah, especially given what Ajatasattu wants from him. Yeah. He's not giving any answer to what Ajatasattu wants. But if you look into how he's thinking about it and how he might want Ajatasattu to interpret what he said, then you can kind of see what you were saying before, how he's probably somebody who's very close to the threshold and just hasn't quite crossed it yet. It's somebody who is like just so close to there, right? Because he's doing a very common sort of double negation that we see all the way through Buddhism. When he says, I don't think not, and I don't think not, not, that's a very, very That's very common. Buddhist. Yeah, exactly. And so He's so close to it, he just doesn't have the rest of the picture. It's almost like he's somebody who's right at the door of enlightenment, but he just never really went across it. At the door, but doesn't have the key. Right. So, once all of those are done in the sutta, we start talking about actual Buddhism. So, a lot of the first section of arguments is the Buddha going, hey, if somebody renounced and went and became a religious person, would you bring them back and make them do what they were doing before? To which our king says, no, not at all, Lord. Does several of those points. So, the idea being here that the fruit of the contemplative life would be the the elevation of people from lower births to higher stations via religion would be the first fruit that the Buddha is speaking of. Yeah, exactly. I like this section a lot too because he's giving what is not often given in Buddhism, and that's a liberation theology. There are 
a few theologies like in Christianity, for example, which have been thought up by people across history, like Christianity is the pathway for liberation for black people from white supremacy and racism, or Christianity is liberation of women from the issues of sexism and misogyny. There's specific arguments that are going on in those that are very detailed and we don't need to get into, but what we're seeing here is this structure that exists, the caste system, has slaves and it has farmers, and those people work very hard, and some of them might even enjoy the work that they do. However, just think about how cool it is that they are able to renounce in my way of life in Buddhism, and when they do, all this cool stuff happens. They're content with simple food and shelter, they delight in solitude, and they receive veneration from others. That's awesome. And so you would never say as their king, come back and get back to being a slave or a farmer because it's so cool that they have the option to just quit and pursue ultimate liberation through my way of thinking. It's a very, very cool argument tactic because he doesn't start talking about the three seals of the Dharma. He doesn't tell him about karma and he doesn't tell them about impermanence and suffering and he doesn't tell them about reincarnation. He immediately just says, imagine how cool that would be. And then we get to the higher fruits of the contemplative life. So this is talking about great kings also doing basically the same thing. In the section that is titled Higher Fruits of the Contemplative Life, this is saying the same thing, but for kings as well. So it's kind of talking about the contemplative life being a level playing field where the circumstances of one's birth doesn't mean very much. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's very important given what we've seen so far. We have only seen opinions from these few people who have reached the age and are of the social class where renouncing is a thing they do. These are people who not only did that, but then they also gained a following of people around them. Like historically, we can't in every case, for example, attach Purana Kashapa to a movement of amoralism. That's not something we can do for each of these guys, right? But we do know that somebody renounced, somebody preached amoralism, and that was in the environment. It was in the ecosystem that the Buddha came up in, and so he had to talk about it. And he was like telling King Ajatasattu, all of these people that you've heard from, they're actually a very small sample size. If you wanted to ask this question, just look at my sample size. You don't even have to get answers from them. You don't have to ask all of them. Just look how, how many of them there are because it rejects the social system in which these people came up. It is something completely and totally different, what I'm doing here. And so even high kings and slaves meditate next to each other in what I'm doing for the purpose of enlightenment. So it's, it's definitely presenting a democratized version of liberation. It's interesting to me that Ajitasatu, as a member of the royal class, would consider this a positive. I feel like if a actual king were hearing a mystic declare, you know, equality for, or, or rather, an equal path for everyone, that the king would see that as a problem because it's taking people out of his control. So, I guess perhaps it talks to King Ajitasatu's, uh relative merit that he's seeing this as a positive thing. Uh, it could also be just a matter of he's listening to the Buddha, so of course he's going to listen. But my, that seems not what the ruling class actually wants at all, ever. I would agree with that, and it's fascinating that we see that argument actually hold water with King Ajatasattu. What's fun about it, the way that I interpret it, which it may be completely ahistorical and completely not scholarly, but I just am imagining that King Ajatasattu is not smart enough to understand that he's on top and that he needs everyone to be on bottom. And the Buddha says, you clearly think that all these renunciants are awesome. You went to ask them questions. You went to talk to them in the past. You must think that they have some sort of special status in society. And they do. They're the top of the caste system. The king rules the land, but the Brahmanical class, these renunciants who have gone off, they are absolutely like the most respected and the most venerated in society at the time. And so 
that's why they are supported by alms, why the community gives them food and shelter on a very regular basis is because they're viewed as extremely important to what's going on in that culture. And so he leverages the fact that King Ajatasattu absolutely does support that class of people. And he says, wouldn't it be cool if anybody could be as awesome as them? Even you, right? Even you as a king right now, you could be as awesome as them, especially if you support what I'm doing here. So the Buddha is being an excellent, an excellent arguer and an excellent convincer. And he's really doing good sales here because he's very aware of what King Ajatasattu is thinking about the people he talked to. And he's very aware of how the king relates with renunciants and with these religious movements. And he's definitely using that smartly in how he explains things. Yeah, he's doing a lot of the Socratic method. Like, here's a situation. Let me ask you a question at the end of it. And... I have built the situation such that you are going to have the answer that I want you to have. Exactly. Yeah. And that is very skillful for him. That's very, very skillful. And I appreciate that it didn't immediately get into the hard philosophy stuff. Because for one thing, the Pali Canon, it doesn't like to do that all the time. There's a time and a place for it. The Pali Canon has a lot of texts like this where the Buddha is kind of selling himself, selling his ideas. And when I say selling, I'm, I don't mean like for his own financial gain. I mean like wrapping them up in specific voicings and specific rhetoric that appeals to who he's talking to. This is one of the cooler and one of the more status and power driven ways that he's selling it because the king of the region, the king of the region that supports the Buddha being able to be a renunciant like this, he's asking the Buddha questions about stuff. And the Buddha doesn't believe that the king is the most powerful. He doesn't believe the king has as much status as a renunciant of, of the Buddha. He doesn't believe that the king is like as close to enlightenment as his own disciples. And so he has to really walk a tight line so he doesn't offend and also so that he convinces and brings power onto his side. I wish we had a bit more about this version of Ajatasattu, because referring to him as being possibly kind of stupid as a king is an interesting way to go about it. The idea of a king being like, yes, let's let my people move up in society to to a religious point. Like, like I said, that's not what rulers generally want, but the idea that he might be kind of not a great ruler or not a powerful thinker is an interesting idea that I don't think there's enough here to make any kind of conclusion on. I agree. Perhaps in other suttas we'll get more evidence for that one way or the other. So now we talk about the higher fruits of the contemplative life. Okay, so higher fruits is... I'm, I'm having a hard time seeing what the difference between the higher fruit and first fruit are supposed to be talking about. At the end of the higher fruits, it's still more people going forth by the rules of the monastic code. These sections on the fruits of the contemplative life are not always super organized or specific. It's kind of confusing. We want to be able to draw a straight line from the first section where he says, imagine a slave who does this. Wouldn't that be cool? He goes, we have a slave who does this, wouldn't that be cool? We have a farmer or a uh, laborer who, wouldn't it be cool if they could do that? We could see a king, wouldn't it be cool if they could do that? And then we go to a householder, wouldn't it be cool? It's like, that's out of order. You, 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 one of the steps should have been before the king, it feels like. Yeah, and I think that what's going on there specifically has to do with like a recentering of the straight line of argument that he's trying to make. So people have classified the first sequence from slave to farmer to king to be arguing for the delight of solitude, the pleasure of virtue, and the contentment with like simplicity and stuff. And from here, he's pivoting a little bit because he's about to start talking about mental calm Jonic bliss, insight, knowledge, mind made body, and more. So he's saying, we've talked about all these kinds of people. They're all householders. So all these types of people, if they're householders and they renounce, that's really cool. 
But if they're all householders and they renounce at the coming of a Buddha, here's what happens specifically. So we're building up to the next section where, for one thing, he says what all these people do. They abstain from killing, false speech, stealing, sexuality, all kinds of bad speech, from damaging plant and seed life, from eating at the wrong time. Like There's a huge detailed list of all the things that monks refrain from doing in order to be consummate in their wisdom and perfection, to be consummate in their virtue. It's one of the earliest and most detailed descriptions of the Venia, the monastic rules that we get. And it's one of the most detailed sections dealing with like, what did the Buddha's early disciples do? You know, not, not necessarily the top 10, but like the early followers of the movement while he was still alive. This is a long section, but it's very interesting. Yeah, it's the section where Buddhist ethics are being set down. Like, this is, these are our rules, and the basic structure of these rules kind of makes it clear how things are organized, like, in a in an ethical sense. Like I said, just here are the rules, and, like, some of these are dire, I suppose. Several of these are describe a very severe life, abstaining from dancing, singing, and instrumental music and watching shows. Part of this is not doing a lot of the usual enjoyment of life. And like he abstains from damaging seed and plant life is on here. And it's like, okay, so what are you going to eat? Yeah, exactly. Right. I guess that what they're saying is you can't make your own food. You have to live on alms food. You can't be the one who damages the plant life because that would be bad karma. You you have to actually get it from somebody else who incurred the bad karma for you. But yeah, so these rules are very interesting. We, we talked earlier about how the early arguments are straw men in the sense, at least, that he asks about a mango and they answer with a breadfruit. They gave the premise of King Ajatasattu asking about fruits of the contemplative life a voice filled with all of these different philosophies that existed in the Buddha's ecosystem at the time. And so in that they captured all those movements in the argument that's being made in this sermon. And then when they get to what the Buddha has to say, he actually answers the question like directly, which is, of course, the Buddha would do that, right? It's given the argument structure of the sermon, of course, the Buddha is like, I'm going to answer exactly what you're asking. I'm not going to throw any other weird philosophical crap at you. I'm just going to tell you what is cool about becoming a Buddhist renunciant. I'm just going to tell you what is cool about doing what all of us are doing. And he starts out by saying, all of these different social classes, wouldn't it be cool if they renounced? Well, when they renounce, what do they actually do? In this section, he doesn't give any of the how or the why, he just gives the what, specifically the what. And the reason why is because King Ajatasattu only asked for the what, and everybody else gave him a bunch of how and why, and he just didn't really like it. He thought those answers were stupid. And he thought it was especially stupid whenever he asked for the what and the last guy said, I'm not going to give you the how or why of anything. And he's like, I didn't ask for that. I asked for the what. And so the Buddha says, here's what we do. We abstain from doing all these things. We don't have any of these lifestyles. And you know, this is kind of just drawing the boundaries of what a monastic life in the Buddhist movement would be like. So if he left any of this out, then for example, there may be a monk who goes out there and tries to tell the weather, right? He reads the suttas and meditates, but he also goes out and tries to tell the weather, or he tries to do a counting and calculation for somebody. And he's saying, no, you are just a renunciant. You are a full-on nomadic monk. And it's fascinating. It's a, it's a very cool picture of what early Buddhist monastic life was about. Because as you know, these rules get bent. All of them get bent in very interesting ways as Buddhism progresses through history. All of these about damaging seed and plant life, handling money, dancing and singing, wearing decorations, accepting money, all of these things all get changed and bent given different contexts. So that's very important to know. But we should still appreciate at least that there's like a, a very clear and hard boundary drawn around the lifestyle that King Ajatasattu is asking about. So the rules in the lesser section of virtue are pretty straightforward. Like, all of these, I at least understand the why. Abstaining from singing and dancing is, you know, severe, but I understand why Buddhists are not supposed to do that. Like, that's 
participating in desire and you can't and you're supposed to be uh, getting away from that then we get into the intermediate section on virtue and uh, most of these are expansions on the previous section like it's just more talking about those rules but there are a couple of these that stood out to me so one thing that confused me is specifically consuming stored up goods so this is something the Buddhists abstain from, but why is stored up good specifically a bad thing? Well, that's not full renunciation then. This is also fascinating because there's a little bit of like Martin Luther in what's going on here. And what I mean is like he's giving a little bit of his 95 theses against the Brahmin class because they're supposed to be renunciants and they proclaim that they are holy men and that they are fully renounced from their household life, only to do contemplations to achieve liberation, and so on and so forth. And he's saying, some of them eat stored up food. Some of them try to tell the weather. Some of them accept money. Some of them damage plant life. Some of them watch shows, play games, have luxurious furniture, engage in lowly philosophical debates, run messages and errands for people, engage in political scheming, and do all of these things which are not consummate with the contemplative life. And so he's saying, like, not only are they wrong in those six ways that we talked about earlier, but also they're kind of corrupt and they're doing stuff that's not really jiving with the rest of their presentation. Right. I, I suppose if all you're allowed to own is a robe and a bowl, then you can't have stored up goods. I guess I'm still thinking about this from a layperson perspective where not having stored up food is foolish. But different rules apply to monastics, so fair enough, I suppose. Yeah, because in this society, it is very consistent that like monastics will be able to eat. They won't eat as much and as often and as regularly as a lot of people in the West who are financially able do, but they are certainly fed and supported by the community because they're holy ones, right? Right. People get good karma from donating to them. And we've talked about how like almsgiving is good for both the bodhisattva or the monk and also for the layperson in an important way. And so they will get fed in most cases. So whenever they don't store up food and whenever they don't make their own food and whenever they don't own anything, then there's still good chances for them. Right. It's a different enough society that not having stored up food is less foolish for them. Right. Uh, I suspect if they tried that today, they would have a much harder time. They do try it today, and they do have a much harder time. Yep. So next we go to the great section on virtue, and here the Buddha is basically saying no magic stuff. So it's called the animal arts. So why animal arts? I think that that's a translation choice that actually is trying to convey vulgar, lowly, base, scheming and trickery, illusory, dishonesty. It's not something that's up to snuff. It's kind of it's kind of like cheating the system for survival. It's kind of predation in the sense that it's like selling something fake to a society which is designed to support the correct execution of the lifestyle that you are proclaiming to practice. I don't know why the translator made that specific choice. There's nothing about animals that entails magic and spells and even medicine is in here too. It's odd. Practicing medicine of any kind is considered a big no-no. However, we should remember all of these monastic rules exist, but none of them actually exist in the sense that like right. people did all this stuff. You know, Buddhist people and non-Buddhist people did all this stuff. And it's cool and important that we have a text that says all these things are bad, but it still happened. There are several entries on here that I want to go into specifically. So, for one, interpreting dreams. This has been in offline discussions. I don't think we've really brought this up on the show, but my understanding is that dreams are super important in Buddhism, and they do get interpreted. Yeah, they are and they do. The interpretation of dreams is separated by about a thousand years from the Buddha's life. Like Ah. a lot of that doesn't get very important until 
Buddhism gets to China and gets pretty established there because in Taoism and in Confucianism, dreams and in Chinese folk religion as well, dreams are pretty important. But during the Buddha's life, the idea is you're not supposed to do that. Another entry on here that stood out to me was straight, like, this is the last list of stuff before we go into the sense restraint section, but demonology. What? Are there demons in Buddhism? I didn't, like, I know Maras are a thing, and there are various, there are various supernatural entities, but this is the first time I've heard demons mentioned in Buddhism, and it's like, is that the translator doing something weird, or is this something that I haven't heard of before? That's 100% a translation issue. He means hungry okay. ghosts. Gotcha. Okay. And there is the idea, too, of like the native spirits. Like In this Brahmanical landscape, there is the idea that there are some kind of native spirits or lower deities or lower gods which can cause mayhem and can cause possessions and can cause trouble very similar to how the hungry ghosts can. And there are people who proclaim that they fix that, that they are able to undo possessions, undo all of the parasitic relationship that demons or hungry ghosts have with the community. And it's fascinating because that's a massive, huge part of localized Buddhist practice all across Asia. But the Buddha says, don't do it. He says, if you're doing this, you're basically a grifter. No one should ever proclaim to be a monk, but also then do these kinds of rituals of demonology, of placating the hungry ghosts. And then he turns around to Madhgalyayana and he says, your parents were reborn in the realm of hungry ghosts. You should go and make food offerings for them. I don't know how that's any different from demonology. Most of these have exceptions that I have seen elsewhere and I suspect as I read more Buddhist literature, I'm going to see more exceptions. And as a matter of non-duality, I suspect the Buddha would also say, you know, to me right now as I'm making these observations, that I'm being too discerning, that I'm thinking about it too hard, that non-dualism makes this make sense. He would say that you're thinking a little too hard about it. Yeah. And I'm just going to do that because that's who I am. but. It's definitely the sort of thing where exceptions happen, and not that big a deal, I suppose, at the end. Let's see, I also want to loop back a bit for a moment about the idea of me uh, doing medicine. It seems to me that that could be explained by saying, hey, if you're doing medicine and your patient dies, that's violence. Yeah, exactly. It is. And it's also a little bit of like drawing a boundary between Buddhism and the Brahmanical society at the time because Vedic medicine was something that Brahmanical people could practice and did practice that was allowed for them, even if they did it and their patients died, it wasn't necessarily bad karma for them in that system. And so in addition to saying, cutting people up is harming them. It's also saying, if you do this, then that's very un-Buddhist of you. And so they may do that over there, but we don't do that over here. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're prohibited from seeking that medicine if they want it. So there is a little bit of, I don't want to say hypocrisy, but a little bit of like rules for me, not for the type of things going on because like they can't do this to people, but if they need to have surgery or they need ointments, then they can go get them and use them. And it's just fine. Very strange kind of dichotomy there. It's not, I don't really see that as being incompatible because they're also not allowed to go out and get food for themselves either, but they still eat. So it makes sense to me to tell the monks not to be doctors. Again, specifically because being a doctor means there's a high chance of doing some sort of violence to your patients at some point. But, you know, again, they also don't harm plant life or seeds, but they're still going to eat them. That makes sense, yeah. Maybe it's kind of like if we make the analogy of you're sitting down getting trained for an IT job and they tell you, you know, we don't tell the weather here. We don't do medicine here. We don't do accounting here. We do IT. But that's not stopping the IT worker from being able to go and get medicine, get weather predictions, get, you know, accounting done, all that sort of thing. Right. 
So then we get into some more abstract actions that they want uh, Buddhists to be taking. So sense restraint, mindfulness and alert, contentedness, abandoning the hindrances. This feels like stuff that we've talked about a lot already. Yeah, and it is. So moving past those, since we don't need to recover treaded ground, the four jhanas. So the jhanas have been an interesting topic to me because I have seen a lot of discussion of them as being intensely pleasurable. And that's not what Buddhism is about. Like, what? What? Why? Why are we becoming intensely pleasurable in a religion that is about do not want? That's a good question. And it is pleasurable. Like, these, these jhanas are definitely meant to be shown to the person as being pleasurable. However, we should also remember that the third one is the one where feelings of pleasure start to go away, and the fourth one is when all feelings of any kind go away. So only the first two are as rapturous and joyous as that. They have to be kind of enjoyable or presented that way to make people want to do them, because we have to remember that these are states which are non-linear, but still are in a hierarchy. They're increasingly hard to get to. So someone could theoretically sit down and start at the fourth one, but that one's the hardest one to get to by far, right? So you don't necessarily have to progress through one, two, three, four, but you could probably get away with doing one after you have done good practice of getting rid of the five hindrances first for a long time, and you're really good at that. One is low-hanging fruit for you. Relatively speaking, this is all very difficult meditative practice. No one would want to do those things if it wasn't enjoyable. And also, like there is a lot of self-reported pleasure from it. So one of the pleasures is just the absence of the stress of daily life, right? You basically feel like you have escaped. You've escaped into something that is completely removed from the daily sufferings that you deal with. And you've set aside that time for something that heals, something that makes your mind feel better. And that's one reason why we say these first two jhanas are very pleasurable. There's self-reporting there that it's pleasurable. And then it fits into the Buddhist philosophy whenever we start to abandon feelings of pleasure and abandon all feelings at all. So that progression is meant to be very joyous because I don't think anyone would do it otherwise. It's still just an interesting aspect to a religion that's otherwise calling for restraint on pleasurable activities. So, but I also understand that it's part of part of getting people to do this kind of stuff is to make it sound like a good thing to do. So, at least tactically, that makes sense. It still feels a little philosophically inconsistent. Yeah, and it's also important to remember, too, that if people do it because they want to feel good, if they want that pleasure, then they're actually going to hit a wall pretty hard. Because yeah. if you're doing it for desire of pleasure, you're not going to be able to get past the second one. And if your desire is like hardcore enough, then you're not even going to be able to get past the five hindrances in the first place. So as pleasurable as they are, the pleasure itself is a byproduct rather than the real fruit in the moment. I suspect there are people out there who would definitely take the pleasure as the product, but like you said, those people are also unlikely to ever get there. Right. Uh, so, next is insight knowledge. So, basically, this is talking about understanding themselves and their place in the world. Yeah, exactly. The, the Sanskrit term for this insight knowledge is prajna, which is like consummate knowledge of the nature of mind and reality and the relationship thereof. This is part of enlightenment, but it's not the whole story. You can get insight knowledge on the way. You can get jhanic bliss on the way. You can get supernatural powers on the way. And no one of those is the whole thing, but this is a huge, a huge upfront selling point as to what's going on. Next section is the mind-made body, and this one I did not get. This is a really tough section. I spent one third of one of my semesters in graduate school in a class talking about this section alone. Not the entire semester, but 
this was one of the readings in the whole class, this sutra. And we, we ended up talking about this section for an entire third of the time. And the reason why is because there's suspicion that it might be an addition by a later author for some reason. There's suspicion that a Yogacara author came back and put that in there to try and make this into a canonical Yogacara text. There's suspicion that it's not a later edition and that it's actually one of the attainments that it's supposed to be talked about and it's supposed to be practiced regularly and just isn't really talked about that much in other texts for some reason. There's a lot of weird stuff going on here. But of course, as it says in the text, from his body, the meditator creates another body which is endowed with form but made of the mind and is complete in all its parts. It's not inferior in any of its faculties. Just as if a man were to draw a sword from a scabbard and know that the scabbard is the scabbard and the sword is the sword, and I drew the sword from the scabbard. That is fascinating. One important point I think about that is that if you create the perfect practitioner in your mind, then that might assist in making your practice perfect. If you are imagining yourself differently, it might make your practice go differently. Another aspect is maybe sort of a decentering from your sense of self. So you don't want to think that the person or the entity undergoing these meditative attainments and these meditative changes is you as your body, as you occupy your body. You want to think of it differently. And this is maybe step one of thinking of it as decentered from your physical body, from your sense faculties, and start to understand the true nature of like the aggregates or something like that. It sounds similar to me to, and we're getting way outside of Buddhism at this point, but it sounds similar to me about the way people talk about tulpas, except instead of a distinct mental presence, it's another version of yourself. Like talking about that as like creating the perfect practitioner in your mind, like that there's some overlap there. Presuming you know what the word tulpa means, I just realized I haven't, that's not a common one. Right. And for the listeners, that is, if I get this correctly, a manifestation of something from the mind of somebody. Yeah, sort of. I have heard it described as like an adult version of an imaginary friend, if they're wanting to be really dismissive about it. But it's basically people creating a separate mental personality that they talk to. And it's it sounds like this is doing something like the mind made body is trying to do something similar, except instead of a distinct entity, it's another version of yourself. Yeah, it's fascinating. And what's interesting is whether or not this mind made body is separate from you physically, like can this body or should this body go somewhere else or be somewhere else than your physical body is? Or are you basically making a mind made body that populates your current body, but doesn't have whatever inferiority or, or, or disability or health problem or whatever other suffering that this body has, and it occupies the same space, but is just better off? I don't know. Like, I imagine like, he's speaking to a king in this sense, obviously, but what if he were speaking to somebody who had lost a leg and the loss of the leg was obviously like a huge barrier to believing in and practicing what the Buddha has to say. And so maybe one way to help that person overcome believing themselves as being legless in the sense that they believe in a self that has legs that can be removed, he says, imagine a mind-made body that does have both legs. And now you're starting to realize that this body you have endowed with all of its health problems and sufferings and disabilities is not anything other than the aggregation of some sort of physical matter that itself is empty and will eventually change, disaggregate, and re-aggregate differently some other time, right? So it's a very tough section. I don't think that we'll be able to get to a really clear answer about what it is, why it's here, and whether it's original or not, just in this time we have, because it's complicated. Yeah, there's a lot going on there that we're not going to be able to penetrate here. So with that, we move on to supernormal powers, clear audience, mind reading, recollection of past lives. Like, there's a lot 
as you go on, things get more and more cosmic and extreme in their benefits. They do, yeah. And again, this is one of the few places where we actually see what supernatural powers and what knowledges you get actually explained explicitly. You're able to walk on water. You can fly whenever you sit cross-legged. You can hear things with your divine ear element that humans can't hear. It kind of starts to explain how enlightened people or near enlightened people can interact with like devas because devas don't just talk to anybody. They speak with a voice that creates a divine sound element, which can only be perceived by a divine ear element, which is better than a regular ear. And so all of this is really, really high level attainment that I think he's trying to sell to Ajatasattu. Like if you practice for enough time, not only will you get all the things we've talked about so far, but you'll even get supernatural powers and recollection of past lives and so on and so forth. I didn't find particularly much to specifically talk about in these sections, just because like, it's a matter of the Buddha saying, here are the things you'll be able to do. And there's not really much of a way to question that here. Either, much less likely, but either back in the past there was a guy who could do a whole bunch of supernatural stuff, or this is stuff that is being added to that to make him seem and sound more powerful. Yeah, I agree. There's not really a lot there's not really a lot to say about it because we've seen some of it before and also as interesting as it all is, these are not provable or disprovable claims. And so I think that the order in which we see them and the presentation that we see of them is interesting in the sense of the dialogue he's having with with a high king with whom he has a very specific and very tightly balanced power relationship. But beyond that, this is stuff that we have seen before. And as cool and trippy as it is to think about someone who can walk through walls and appear and vanish on command, that's all very fun. But it doesn't tell us anything about what the Buddha wants to actually teach this guy so that he gets those powers eventually. So the last section we see is the ending of effluence. So this is kind of leading into the idea of nirvana, like the ending of existing, kind of. That's right, yeah. This section is also often translated as the release from samsara section. He's able to stop the outflowing of reality because he's left it. He's able to stop his own karmic outflowing because he's transcended karma, right? So effluence or ending effluence is this specific translation choice to indicate that all of the causal outflows of everything that people do all the time, the person who practices Buddhism and attains enlightenment can make those stop for themselves. They can stop themselves from causing or emitting these effluence out into the world around them because they are released from the bounds of samsara. And then the sutta ends with uh, Ajitasatsu admitting to killing his father. Yeah, that's a very fascinating section. That is very fascinating because it's a huge twist. It's like, okay, we just got taught all this really cool stuff and all this interesting stuff that'll happen to a person who practices and follows this. And then he's like, by the way, I killed my dad. You know, like, wow, <laughs> that's very interesting from a narrative standpoint. But I think that it gets explained in the section in a way that would be kind of sensible to someone who reads this. It gets explained as him making this confession in order to make amends. He's like, I didn't talk to anybody else that I spoke to. All the other renunciants, you know, without accepting or denying, without pledging allegiance or denouncing, I just said thank you and left. However, in front of the Buddha, he's like, without stating that he's thinking this, he's like, okay, I have picked the Buddha. He's the one who's right out of all these people. So he has to know up front that I've done something really bad in order to accept me into his flock. And so that's why he just immediately says, by the way, I killed my father to seek sovereign rulership. It's fascinating because I don't know historically how true that claim is in the context of Buddhism. We do have historical record other than these texts that King Ajatasattu, who was a real historical figure, was a lay follower of Buddhism. But this whole interaction that he has where he 
emotionally declares to the Buddha after this dialogue with him that he killed his father. We don't know if that happened. We don't know if the story of this sermon actually happened. And if it didn't happen, then it's a very interesting narrative choice and a very interesting rhetorical choice on the part of the authors of the sutra. And it's also important to note that after he makes that confession, the Buddha's like, all right, you're still in. Like That's a big deal as well. Yeah, well, especially if the sermon, as it was written down much, much later after the death of the Buddha, said, and then the Buddha said, go away. One thing, it would be ahistorical because the king was a lay follower of the Buddha. And on the other hand, they needed to reconcile how he could have actually killed his father, but still been allowed to like be near the Buddha and like follow him and listen to him and be preached to by him. And they explain like, okay, he killed his father and he listened to all these renunciants, but didn't really like any of them. Why should we believe that the Buddha allowed him to even be near him and have and preach to him? Like, why would the Buddha preach to him? Because being preached to by the Buddha is huge. Not everybody gets that. That's a huge karmic reward for something. And the Buddha has to say later on, near the very, very end, he's like, if not for having killed his father, then King Ajatasattu would be sitting here right now preaching. You know, he would be a great Buddha himself. And that's why I let him join the flock, even though he killed his father. So they do have to do a little bit of historical explanation around the time of the authorship or the writing down of this text, which would have been at the very earliest, it would have been second century or third century BC. And at the latest could have even been like around the first century common era. Thanks for joining us in our discussion and reading of the Samanapala Sutta, the Fruits of the Contemplative Life Sutta. We hope you enjoyed, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you for listening.